The final item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 17102 in the name of Kezia Dugdale on Foster Care Fortnight 2019. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. So please, if you wish to speak in the debate... Uh, I'm sorry, I'll start that again. If any member wishes to speak in the debate, please press the request speak buttons now. And I call on Kezia Dugdale to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer, and thanks to colleagues for signing the motion and staring to hear the debate this evening. Let me say from the offset that this won't be my last speech in the Chamber, but it will be my last Members' debate. And throughout my eight years here, I've always tried to use these slots for a purpose, from payday loans to mesothelioma, living wage to rate prosecution rates. I've sought to push the Minister hard for answers, and I intend to do so again today. Of course, we should take a moment to celebrate and thank foster carers for the job that they do. There's a debate to be had about the degree to which you consider fostering employment in the traditional sense. But first and foremost, the job they do is to provide a loving home for children and young people who, for whatever reason, need it. I'm grateful to Shirley, Alex and others who travelled from Lanarkshire and Lonehead this morning to share their direct experiences with me and equally thanks should go to my constituents who have allowed me to share their stories with the Chamber this evening. But the best way we can show our gratitude is to listen hard and choose to act upon what we hear. Scotland needs at least 580 more foster families as things stand. Closer to 900 if you factor in what would happen if every young person entitled to continue in care actually took it up. Recruitment is tricky and numerous local authorities are reporting difficulties. Whilst there's a national minimum standard on pay and allowances, local authorities are now supplementing that to attract families. And that's creating a market economy in what should clearly be a state responsibility. For these are our children. What's more, when a foster placement comes to an end, a foster carer goes from a full income to zero income in the space of four weeks. They only get paid when they have a placement, despite giving up work to be foster carers. The money only starts when the next placement begins, with no control over when a match will be made. It's the equivalent of a zero hours contract for something as important as caring for a vulnerable child. Now, I know the Care Review is looking into this, as there are many fundamental changes, but some of the solutions are so screamingly obvious, they should be made now. An example of this is clearly keeping brothers and sisters together. Now, I heard the Scottish Government announce plans to keep siblings together earlier this year, and I was delighted to hear it. But when I started to look for details of how that would be done, there was precious little available. And I know from PQ answers from the Minister that there's a plan to place legal requirements on local authorities to keep siblings together in the forthcoming Family Law Bill. And that is welcome. But as we have seen so many times in this chamber before, legislating for something and it actually becoming a reality are two very different things. Now, I led for Labour and Education through the passage of the 2014 Children and Young People Act that gave looked after young people entitlements to continuing care and aftercare. But five years after its passage, precious few young people actually realised those rights. One way we can fix this is by ensuring that the fostering allowance is available for everyone in continuing care. If fostering is how you pay your mortgage, how can we expect those carers to live off half the money they used to receive simply because they continue to house someone they love and care for past their 18th birthday? President officer, there's a few broader points I wish to make about housing now. Today's daily record carries a story about Jamie Kinlochan, who many in this chamber will know as one of the leading advocates for looked after young people in this country. Outside of his day job, he has now made the commitment to become a foster carer himself, but hit a blockade immediately upon applying because he doesn't have a spare room. That ruled him out completely. The first question was not, what do you know about trauma? Or attachment theory? Or even something simple as, what makes for a loving home? It was, how many bedrooms do you have? If we're to break down the barriers to people putting their name forward to foster, it has to start here. I understand the fostering network this afternoon warned about abandoning the requirement for foster children to have their own room, but that's not what I'm calling for at all. 
The change I'm looking for is that people who apply to be foster carers, a process which can take 18 months, should be asked to make a commitment to live in a suitable house before they take on their first placement. Jamie doesn't have a spare room today, but he's committed to doing that in three months or six months, well ahead of the time of placing the first young person with him. And do you know what else? We, the state, the corporate parent, we should be helping him and many other loving families like him to do that. I'd go as far as to give them extra cash to move because look at what we're spending on the alternative. It can cost up to £6,000 a week to house a child in secure care. A fraction of that would help a foster carer suitably house a young person. And that's the financial cost. Before you even consider the human cost, and this is where I get really angry, where rules and bureaucracy, competing priorities and the culture of it's I been get in the way of providing safe, loving and stable homes, where algorithms compound trauma and young people become yet again a number in a system we know is broken. I have a constituent who lives in a three bedroom house two miles from this building. She has one birth child, fosters a baby intermittently around their parents' cancer treatment. She can stay in their bedroom. But she also fosters a set of mixed sex twins. They've lived with her since they were one years old. They are seven now, going on eight. When they turn eight, they will not be allowed to share a room anymore because of their different genders, and one of them will have to move out unless a more suitable home can be found. This woman has lived in the same council house for 15 years, the same street in Craig Miller for 22 years, but is prepared to move to keep her family together. She came to me because the council told her she wouldn't get priority or extra points for being a foster carer. How incredibly, stupidly short-sighted is that? The computer says no. And we're on the cusp of breaking up a family, separating siblings, knowing all the damage that will do. When I checked the rules with Spice, they told me that just two weeks ago, on the 1st of May, provisions that this Parliament passed in the Housing Scotland Act in 2014 came into effect. Provisions which said that landlords should give serious consideration to giving additional priority based on adopting, fostering or being a kinship carer. Five years on to seriously consider it. It's just not good enough. So warm words are great, but they are meaningless in the demand for meaningful change. In conclusion, let me present to the Minister a mini manifesto. Pay foster carers the same rate for continuing care. Don't rule out families based on the size of their house at stage one. Keep siblings together by prioritising looked after children in the housing system. Incentivise suitable housing options for people taking their first step. Stop local authorities competing with each other for foster carers and end zero hour contracts for those very foster carers. Maybe then we'll have more to celebrate than the work of a community of foster carers whose lives are devoted to this simple act of providing a safe and loving home. Thank you. Move on to the open debate. Speeches of up to four minutes, please. Rona Mackay, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to Kezia Dugdale for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. And I thank her for her very powerful opening speech on behalf of so many children looking for a home. Foster Care Fortnight is the perfect opportunity to highlight the fantastic work that foster carers do. I'm not sure that the word work really is appropriate here, as I'm sure it's much more than that for them. People I know who have fostered talk of how their lives have been enriched by the young addition to their family, however temporary or more long term. As a former children's panel member, I was constantly in awe of the foster parents who attended hearings, clearly with the best interests of their foster child or children at heart. However, as we, we know and as we've heard, there are issues which must be addressed now. In Scotland, there are approximately 4,000 foster families who do an amazing job. But that still leaves the foster carer shortfall of 580 needed in the next 12 months. That's 580 more families who could give a child a safe, loving home. Something that most of us may take for granted, but that they've never had. 
A helpful briefing from Action for, for Children, who supports foster carers every day of the year, reports that one in ten people said that nothing would put them off becoming a foster carer, and that's encouraging. So why the shortfall in foster carers? Is it lack of knowledge? Is it the many issues that, that Kezia has highlighted? Um, or, or fear of taking on the, the responsibility? Or is it down to family finances? Understanding what allowances and fees a foster carer is entitled to is a minefield due to the differences throughout the UK and different policies adopted by fostering services. Scotland doesn't currently have recommended minimum allowances for foster carers and payments vary depending on where you live. Presiding officer, fostering can be an enriching, positive way to help children, sometimes the most vulnerable in our society. It should not be a stressful experience and money worries should not be a feature. What price can you put on giving children a warm, loving home? The Scottish Government has committed to making national recommendations in the near future. I believe this must be resolved now and I look forward to the Minister updating us on that in our closing speech. Presiding officer, I'd also like to mention concurrent planning. Quite simply, it means that a foster carer would look after a child while it's decided if a child couldn't go back to live with their birth family or not. If it's decided that the child can't go back to their family, foster carers can then apply to adopt the child. When the decision to put the child forward and adoption happens, all the hard work is done and approval can happen much quicker than waiting for a year or so. It's much better for the child and relieves the stress on the adoptive parents. The Fostering Network is uh, the UK's leading fostering charity. They, along with excellent third sector organisations, work to ensure all foster children experience stable family life and they're passionate about the difference foster carers make, not just to children, but by supporting foster families and carers. I look forward to hosting an event in Parliament for the Fostering Network next Wednesday, uh, 22nd of May, where I expect many of the issues we're discussing today will be continued. Foster carers come from all walks of life and a wide range of backgrounds, cultures and ethnic groups. No, no upper age limit, your sexuality, marital status or whether you own a home, that doesn't matter, although we, we, we have heard issues from Kesey on that one. Uh, the only thing that matters is that you're giving a child the most important thing in the world, a caring, loving home and an equal chance to thrive and grow. Thank you. Michelle Ballantyne, followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, presiding officer. Every 20 minutes in the UK, a child comes into care needing a foster family. In Scotland, of the 14,738 looked after children in 2017, 35% were in foster care. Whilst that is not enough, it actually represents an increase of 66% since 2002. But we do have to do more. Because having worked with children in care, I am in no doubt about just how important the right placement for a child is. In the words of a child who has moved into foster care, the first night I fell asleep with the biggest smile on my face, I felt at home. The Independent Care Review under the chairmanship of Fiona Duncan is currently working with and listening to those who provide and experience care. I want to thank them for the work they are doing because I believe it will change the way we think about the delivery of care for some of our most vulnerable children, those who are dependent on the state to make most, most right decisions. And it's that dependent on the state that I think brings this debate to the chamber today. Because building resilience to cope with the issues that life throws at you is essential for every child. Babies are not born with resilience to stress, but they are born with the ability to become resilient if provided with the right environment. If a child or young person has to go into care, then making the right decisions early are key. Identifying the right placement and ensuring that foster carers and those involved in the decision making have the right training and development is essential, particularly when it comes to the effect of trauma on children. Children and young people in care often feel that they have no control over the decisions that impact on their lives. And I am concerned that too many children have their placements moved, often without consultation, and often when the foster carer themselves is not happy about it. And this in turn undermines the relationships that have been built with carers, and not just with their carers. Children build relationships with, with others in care settings akin to that of the, those of siblings. The emotional impact of being moved can be felt as heavily as being separated from blood relatives. In the words of one young person, my foster siblings were there, that was my security, that was my safety. 
Concern has also been expressed by foster carers and practitioners who perceive a lack of emphasis on the current system on helping a child maintain links with their siblings and their original community and friends. Instabilities in relationships, place and school all militate against the stability that is crucial to any child. It is vital for a child's emotional health to recognise their key attachments and to maintain birth family links wherever possible if they're not detrimental to the child. But this requires good, solid support for foster carers. They need the aid, not only financially, but in the support networks and the training that they receive. Deputy Presiding Officer, we cannot treat foster caring lightly. And I echo all of the sentiments that Kezia Dugdale offered in her opening statement. Because at the end of the day, when they come into state care, when the local authority becomes the corporate parent, that responsibility extends even further than that of an ordinary parent, because those decisions affect that child for the rest of their life. And we see that when their attainment is not as good, we see that when they get into more trouble, we see that when they fail to know the love and security that a child has a right to expect. But tonight I'd like to end my contribution by paying tribute to the 4,000 foster families in Scotland. Foster carers really matter in the lives of infants, children, young people and their families. By providing consistent support, care and love, they are giving children and young people the chance to thrive. And as one foster carer said, and I think it echoes very much the words of Kezia Dugdale, we have made a lifelong commitment to these children, and we think this needs to be recognised in a more formal way. We don't forget children when they become young adults, and we have a lifetime with them as they are part of our families. Thank you. Ian Gray, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thanks to my colleague, Kezia Dugdale, who has been a champion of care-experienced uh, young people throughout her time in this Parliament for bringing forward this important debate this evening. Uh, we can be in no doubt of the irreplaceable role that foster carers play within our society. Our approach to care in Scotland depends upon thousands of foster parents and families, committed and highly skilled, able to provide loving and secure homes. For our young people. So during this campaign, uh, we must not just acknowledge but also celebrate the vital contribution these carers make. But we must also listen to organisations such as Action for Children, already mentioned, uh, and the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain Foster Carers Network, who are working to improve the circumstances of foster carers and those looking to foster. Uh, but to do all of this properly, we have to understand the issues that they are facing and the reason why we have a significant shortfall. Uh, only then can we get round to finding solutions to improve things for foster families uh, and indeed for our young people. And the truth is, fostering in Scotland is becoming more difficult, not least due to the significant financial pressures which exist on individual foster carers. In the system as a whole, between 2015 and 2017, we saw a drop of 591 in the number of households approved for foster care for longer uh, than exclusively short breaks. Fostering services report a rise in staff vacancies with an 8% increase in the same period since 2015. These increased vacancies are also becoming harder to fill uh, as the number of fostering services who report difficulty recruiting has risen from 10 to 17. In 2017, 45% of fostering services experienced a net loss of households. And we hear from potential foster carers that have been dissuaded from applying, uh, as we did from Kezia Dugdale, due to criteria such as needing a spare room uh, uh, during the 18 months of their assessment. As Kezia said, that is not what should be the priority. The priority should be what they can offer young people. Uh, I was uh, shocked to hear from my own uh, council fostering team that they need to identify 100 interested families for every one which completes the journey to fostering. That's how hard this is. And a significant problem exists with fragmentation of the regulation of foster carers across 32 different local authorities. Uh, and that leads to disruptive irregularities in the placement of children, 
uh, and indeed council has been both assessor and employer uh, of foster carers. It is one aspect uh, of the disruptive market uh, which Kezia spoke about in her introductory speech. The IWGB are currently working on proposals for a nationally coordinated approach towards assessment and registration uh, and indeed to deregistration de as well. Such an approach would also allow for a much more fluid and flexible network of foster carers who are independently assessed on their fitness to foster, which would of course better serve young people. Such a change, in my view, has merit and deserves scrutiny and consideration. Uh, and I look forward to working with and hearing more uh, from the IWGB about these proposals and how we can progress them. We've heard tonight that we know what many of the problems are. We've heard about some of the possible solutions. Several colleagues have mentioned the ongoing care review, and that is, of course, vital to transforming the lives of care-experienced young people in this country. But the truth is that we need not wait until its conclusion to start making the changes that we know we need to. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I congratulate Kezia Dugdale on securing today's debate to Matt Foster Care of Fortnight 2019 and for her impassioned opening speech. Fostering is one of the greatest things a person can do, shaping both the future of the foster child or young person and the family which cares for them. Regardless of why a child or young person can no longer live with their family, being welcomed into a loving and stable home through fostering can be an enriching and indeed life-changing experience. Foster Care Fortnight, organised by the Fostering Network, runs from the 13th to the 26th of May and is focused on that very idea, changing a future. Latest figures show that as of the 31st of July 2018, 5,058 children and young people in Scotland are being fostered in families either through their local council, an independent fostering agency or a charity like Action for Children, which provided an excellent briefing for today's debate. That figure is an incredible demonstration of the generosity of families across Scotland, and yet there remains, as Kezia Dugdale and Rona Mackay pointed out, an estimated shortfall of 580 foster carers today. This gap must be closed to ensure we do right by Scotland's children and young people, providing the love, care and safety they need and deserve. In a survey of 1,000 Scots commissioned by Action for Children, a heartening 11% said there was nothing stopping them from becoming a foster carer. But clearly there is because we need to translate that attitude into increased numbers fostering. Awareness raising events like Foster Care Fortnite play a big part, presenting an invaluable platform for sharing information about how to become a foster parent, eligibility, allowances, the effect on the host's family, and the transformative impact fostering has on a child or a young person's life. The same survey found that one of the biggest obstacles to people becoming foster carers was feeling that it didn't fit in with their lifestyle. It's therefore important to dispel some persistent myths about fostering, that you cannot be too old to become a foster carer, you don't need to be heterosexual, married or own your own home. What makes fostering so valuable, valuable is a wide range of backgrounds and life experience that fosterers bring to the table. As, as long as you're over 21, have a spare bedroom, and that issue has been obviously discussed quite a lot already this, uh, this afternoon, the time, energy, and loving home to provide, you could be a valued foster carer. With the right support, many more people can be empowered to become foster carers. In my Cunningham North constituency, the North Ayrshire Family Placement Team offer a confidential and extremely informative service to help people decide if now is the time to foster. They are there for foster carers every step of the way, from an in-depth and personalised induction to regular training and support sessions. They even offer the opportunity to study for an SVQ Level 3 in caring for children and young people at no cost to the foster carer. Evidence demonstrates that sibling relationships are incredibly important in nurturing continuity, security and stability for children. It's therefore vital to place siblings together as much as possible, provided that is in their best interests. Unfortunately, it is particularly challenging to recruit households to foster sibling groups, largely due to accommodation constraints. And we have to be more flexible in how local authorities allocate housing to households with growing foster families. Uh, and, and at the 31st of December 2017, there were 1,012 sibling groups in foster care, and sadly, 23% were separated on placement. I'm therefore pleased that in March this year, the Scottish Government outlined plans to strengthen the law to place brothers and sisters together when in care and give that higher priority than at present. 
I was also pleased to see recognition of the importance of brothers and sisters who are not able to live together maintaining contact as these relationships are critical to a child's well-being. Other than fostering, there are many other ways to support looked after children in what can be a challenging period in their lives. For example, the charity Comfort You Bags or Cubs provides a bag pack filled with items to help ease the transition into first-time foster care. From a soft toy or blanket to pens, books or craft supplies, essentials like toothpaste and shower gel, each cub is carefully put together to support the well-being of each individual child. The value of a seemingly small gesture cannot be overstated, and I commend Cubs and all their volunteers. Presiding officer, foster carers change lives for the better, whether that is immediately by providing a place of safety at a time of need or part of a longer journey towards a brighter future. One thing is certain, the caring and support of actions of foster carers will be felt throughout a foster child's life. The last of the open debate contributions is from Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also um, thank uh, Kezia for uh, bringing this uh, debate forward uh, this evening. Um, I suppose I come to this with a very personal side. As uh, some members uh, will know, last autumn, my wife and I started fostering um, a little boy with the hope of adopting him. Uh, for lots of different reasons, that uh, arrangement broke down um, earlier this year and he um, had to leave her, our household. Um, and as I've been on this journey with my wife and have spoken to many other individuals and couples uh, who want to foster and adopt, uh, a number of things have struck me. And I'd just like to maybe share three of them briefly with you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The first thing I think we have to acknowledge is that it is becoming harder and harder for people to want to foster. The recruiting process puts people off. For myself and my wife, the process took over 18 months from the day that we started the process. That is due to pressure of social work, but actually I think there is almost a mentality of trying to peep, peep people off, uh, fostering and adopting. And um, I was struck by Kedja's remark, by the first comment that person was asked is, do you have two rooms? And that's not the only story that I've heard over the last number of years. People who want to go ahead and foster are often put off at that first stage. And I do think we need to look at the process of how we recruit individuals uh, to come ahead and foster. Yes, we need to get the right checks. Yes, we need to get the right people for the most vulnerable in our society. But at the same time, we need to encourage, not discourage. Secondly, and uh, picking up to some extent the comments made already, is in regard to the uh, money that people receive for fostering. Now, again, I think we could have a debate, and it would be worth having a debate on whether it should be seen as some form of career or not. But what is clear that here in Scotland, a fairly small country, there are different amounts of money paid depending on what local authority it is. For example, uh, the minister's uh, region pays less than Angus plays. Now, to me, that is a similar geographical type. I'm happy to be corrected as a lowlander, but we feel similar to me. Why does Highland pay less than Angus? What is the justification for that? And I am all for localism, but I also do think there's a role for government and parliament to make sure that the payments that people get um, are more reflective across the whole of Scotland. And finally, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I do think uh, social workers within our 32 local authorities and within um, the third sector are under immense pressure. Um, I have been um, amazed by the dedication of the different social workers that I have come into contact with over the last number of years. The hours they put in, the kindness they feel towards the children they're trying to place. But they are under pressure. Uh, they are facing financial difficulties. And some of the decisions that they are forced to make are not necessarily driven by best practice, but simply worked out on financial cost. So I do think we need to look at the resources that we are given social work department. 
I think in conclusion, there is a place for the third sector, which is already there to play a greater role. Uh, Organisations such as Home for Good and others, which are trying to encourage people into fostering, uh, do need uh, to be given uh, the profile that is required. So I welcome this debate, um, but I think there's a danger, if I can conclude with this, that we can have lots of warm, warm words from across each of our parties. But unless all of us are willing to change and bring forward policies that will radically change the most vulnerable in our society, then simply words will change nothing. Thank you. Uh, can I gently remind members, before we move on to the Minister's conclusion, um, it would be helpful if you would always refer to other members by their full name, much as we all like each other, please. Two names is better for the official report and for anyone listening in. You weren't the only one, Mr Balford, it looks guilty. <laughs> and uh, we now move on to the Minister, please, to respond to the debate, and I call Marie Todd for around seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased that today's debate has been an opportunity to highlight the Fostering Network's annual Foster Care Fortnight as a valuable awareness raising campaign. And might I just take this opportunity to add my thank you to the Fostering Network and especially Sarah Lurie and our team in Scotland who provide such valuable pre and post approval foster carer training and much needed support to foster carers through the Foster Line Helpline. It's been, um, I want to thank the member Kezia Dugdale for bringing this issue to the chamber and indeed for her championing of the interests of care experienced children and young people over her time in parliament many years. Um, you raised an, she raised a number of issues um, and I certainly um, I would appreciate um, more detail to look into some of the specific cases that she raised. Certainly with regard to the spare bedroom issue which a number of members have raised, the looked after children regulations and guidance don't specifically stipulate that foster carers have to have a spare room. They do, however, specify that fostering panels have a duty to ensure that um, the needs and well-being of, of looked-after children and the potential impact on prospective foster families are taken into account. Um, given that many children coming into care might, care might be recovering from the effects of neglect or abuse or trauma, these and many unknown factors must be taken into consideration to ensure the safety and protection and privacy of the looked after child. I agree that that um, spare room doesn't necessarily need to be in place at the start of the process, but it certainly um, needs to be in place at the end of the process. I share many of the members' frustra uh, frustrations about the bureaucratic barriers um, and computer says no attitude that people come upon when they're um, attempting to enter the foster um, system. I thought that Jeremy Balfour's personal contribution was very powerful and I'm grateful for it. Um, I, I agree that we need to tackle many of these issues now, but um, the, the purpose of the independent care review was a, a recognition of these many and complex issues which interact, some of them easy to fix, some of them much harder to fix, a recognition that we really do need a root and branch review and we need to be thinking about doing things differently and we need to go on and do things differently. There can be absolutely no doubt that foster caring is challenging at times. The crucial encouragement that foster carers provide to children and young people in their care every day helps in many ways to restore self-belief where it's been eroded and to instill a sense of security and confidence. For children and young people who can no longer live with their families for whatever reason, our foster carers provide a safe, secure and loving family environment, a place to call home. Our national outcomes challenge us to ensure that children and young people grow up with equal opportunities, feeling loved, safe and respected at home and by society. Maintaining the relationships that matter to them most is so important. How do we preserve important relationships? I'd like to touch on some of the issues raised today. 
The recent Care Inspectorate Bulletin on Local Authority and Independent Fostering and Adoption Services provided, um, providers included really important data on the reality of foster care in Scotland. And that report acknowledged the complexities and highlighted a number of positive trends, with 93% of our 60 local authority and independent foster care providers achieving grades of good or better across all quality themes. However, 45% of all foster care services had experienced a net loss in the number of foster carers. Kezia Dugdall raised the issue of keeping brothers and sisters together and the importance of ensuring the best interests of the child are at the heart of all decisions is absolutely evident. But that report also highlighted that local authority foster carers and independent service providers found it a challenge to recruit foster carers to care for, fo for sibling groups. And I did recently announce that we're going to be strengthening the law so that staying in touch with the brothers and sisters will become a much greater priority when we're making plans for children and young people in care. Most of you will be aware by now that the National Review of Care Allowances made 12 recommendations themed on improving consistency and transparency in allowances and also in the information that's available for families and carers. This is a complex area, particularly in the current financial climate, but we are committed to working in partnership with COSLA to respond in a way that best meets the needs of our fostered children and carers. And, and as Jeremy Balfour again mentioned, the situation in, in Highland compared to other uh, local authority areas with similar topography and geography and challenges with sparse po um, population, it is um, difficult to understand the difference in foster care allowances there, but that's why we need to improve the transparency in allowances, explain what's included in the basic allowance and explain what's included in the myriad of extra allowances which people can also claim. A central register of foster carers is something that was considered as part of a previous national review of foster care and at the time it wasn't considered to be a viable option but the potential benefits of a central registration body have been presented to the independent care review and we are interested to hear what conclusions are reached as, they, as areas for improvement in care system are, are explored. I am also very aware of some of the difficulties regarding continuing care and we have been working with and listening to key partners on these issues and are exploring what more that we can do to support a smoother implementation. We want to do what we can to help eligible young people stay with their foster carers and benefit from a much more supported transition into independent living. We as a government look forward to hearing about what further improvements we can all make and, and that will make the care experiences of vulnerable children and young people as valuable and as rewarding as possible. In this portfolio, I have the opportunity to meet lots of young people and I've heard some heartbreaking experiences. I've also heard inspirational stories of the extraordinary people, including foster carers, who have been here to help a child achieve their ambitions and I want to ask all of us to do what we can to support the foster care fortnight campaign to raise awareness about foster caring in Scotland. I thought I'd finish with you know people write to me regularly about their experiences of foster care and I thought it was important to hand the microphone to a foster carer who explains about what drew them to foster caring. We care about children, we want to help them, and we've developed skills through work and parenting that can benefit children in need. We feel that we've done well out of society, and perhaps we can give something back. And I want everyone, to, everyone listening to consider that. Can you give something back? What he said in his final message was, I think, captured beautifully both the joy and some of the heartbreak which comes from foster caring. This man fostered and his, and his wife fostered very young babies. When their time with us comes to an end, there is a delight and a heartbreak in seeing each child move on, either back home or more often to a permanent placement with adopters. We still think about all of the different little characters who have lived with us over the years. As my wife says, Every time a child leaves, they take a little piece of our heart with them. 
I want to end, therefore, by thanking Scotland's foster carers again for their commitment. There is absolutely no doubt that you improve the lives of children and young people in your care, and you make our collective vision for them a reality. Thank you. That concludes the debate, and this meeting is closed. <laughs>